Uh, hi, I'm Varun. I'm here representing LucidWorks, giving a talk on Solar's auto scaling framework. And essentially, what we're going to learn is how, how does Solar's new auto scaling framework help you build out abstractions so that you don't need to deal with lower level APIs to make life easier for you to do operations within a solar cluster. So the agenda being, we're going to discuss briefly about what is autoscaling, then go through concepts like what is autoscaling policies, what is a preference, how does the API work, and then how does this tie into asking solar to trigger and do actions on behalf of the cluster. So while discussing these concepts, we're going to learn and come up with examples of how to use this within your cluster. So the goal of when like, the team started working with autoscaling was you want to autoscale a solar cluster to a trillion documents with minimal human intervention. By that, you do not need to build deep solar expertise or have like a huge solar DevOps team to reach this goal. Right? So solar should help you build this out of the box. So that was the goal we started building this framework with. Why? Do we need auto scaling? Operations is hard to scale, right? Like anyone who's been working on the operations or the platform side of things, you get sucked into this and sometimes it's time consuming. It's tough to build expertise and you always require tooling around so that you can manage your solar cluster, right? You're not, you can't manually go start moving replicas around. That's just not a scalable model, right? So, Till like the auto scaling framework, you would get very low level APIs from solar. So you could have APIs to move a replica from machine one to machine two, but it wouldn't tell you which is the best machine I should move the replica to. So those are the things that we wanted to build out in the auto scaling framework. So how in, in a nutshell, essentially you provide some constraints and assumptions about your cluster. So you define some rules, you define what's important for me. You say is CPU disk uh, search latency or update throughput, what are the constraints that are important to you? And Solar will help you with what operations are required to reach that desired state. Now, how would you describe the cluster, right? If I want to describe the cluster, it's going to be a two-part process. The first part is, how do I lay out my cluster? So it's some basic assumptions about my cluster. I want replicas on unique nodes. People hosting, say, multiple JVMs on the same node, you don't want Solar to add replicas such that both the replicas sit on the same physical machine, right? So Solar can be node aware, things like that. All replicas of a shard must be on the same rack. So if you can utilize that at query time, then you make sure that you improve latencies. At least two replicas must be on the same rack. And these are just a few examples of how you want to define these clusters, right? You, you want to make sure that no particular solar JVM contains more than, say, four solar nodes. So what that will ensure is you're never overloading one particular JVM, right? You're maxing it out at four cores or four replicas. The second part about describing a cluster is you want Solar to provide some tools or some ways to understand if I reach a state where I have more machines or I want to move things around, what is important to me? So you want to be able to define whether system load average, say free disk space, heap usage, number of existing solar cores. So you want to provide it some intrinsic values where you basically say, now I want to use these to then move things around. And we're going to talk about exactly this describing your cluster in terms of auto scaling policies and preferences. So let's start with auto scaling policies. So auto scaling policies are nothing but it defines the desired layout, layout of the cluster. Essentially, it can be done at a cluster level or a per collection level. Think of it as how many people use the old uh, replica-based, like the rule-based placement strategy where you want to define some rules for the cluster. 
So this encompasses that in a more holistic way within solar. So the example that I gave you, right, you want to set a rule in the cluster where no two replicas sit on the same node. That could happen if you have multiple JVMs running on the same physical machine, right? So you want to provide rules such that. So some examples that for auto-scaling policies would be here is the syntax where you would go ahead and say any node in the solar cluster must not have more than five solar cores or five replicas, right? So you would say for any node, I want to make sure that the replica count is less than five. Now, if you want to do that at a per collection basis, so now you want to say for each collection, I want to make sure that replicas sit on unique nodes. So by saying this, I'm making sure that my collection is spread out across the cluster. The second example basically says, do not place more than one replica of a shard on a node. Now, if you remove the shard, like if without the shard each clause in the syntax, this rule would apply to the entire collection. So you can say for each collection or for each shard. Now, I have a use case where say you want to spread out replicas across availability zones, right? So if you have hosting solar on AWS or whatever provider that you use, I want to spread, it, spread my replicas across availability zones. So all you need to do now is when you start a solar node, you give it a system property, just a tag, right? So you want to give it a tag saying this is availability zone one or this is availability zone two while starting up a solar node. And then you can define two rules where you're saying basically for each shard, make sure that the replica count is always less than two. So if I'm creating a two a, a collection which has two replicas, I want to make sure it's spread across the two availability zones. So I'm creating a rule to say on the first availability zone, make sure you only have one replica and do the same for the other availability zone. So in this example, I'm spreading it across two availability zones. And this is essentially morph, this nicely morphs into the same example that I've been talking about where multiple JVMs you could start up and you could say this is belonging to a system property where you say this is node one, right? And you want to ensure that they are on unique nodes. Now, how does the policy API look like? It's basically saying you define this JSON where you say set my cluster property, a policy, and essentially you give it all the rules that you want the cluster to obey. So every action that you now do on the cluster will obey these rules. And if it can't be satisfied, you will not be able to complete that operation. So policies went and said, these are my hard rules that I want to define for my cluster. The second aspect was I want to be able to define some preferences which is basically a language to define load, is how I look at it. What you're telling Solar is within, you have multiple nodes, how do I say which one is more active? So if I want, if I get more resources, which node is more burdened and which replica from those nodes can I move to some extra hardware, right? So you want to define a language where you can specify what's important in your case. So preferences, since they define load, is essentially only at a cluster level. The policies could be at a cluster level or it could have been at a per collection level, but preferences always apply to the cluster level. These aren't hard conditions. So a policy was a hard condition where you said, make sure that they're never violating a rule where availability zones can have more, all my replicas, right? But preferences is not a hard rule. We are saying, how do I sort it? How do I define the cluster load? So a few metrics that you could say, define your cluster load on would be say the number of solar cores. If free disk is a concern, you can define it on the disk space that I have left on my nodes. The heap usage, so if you're using a lot of 
caching in solar, then like maybe you have more replicas sitting on the node and the heap usage is high, so you want to make sure that you want to control, have control over that. Or like load average, right? So you could pick these metrics and say what is important to me. And once you define this, essentially it will tell solar if it has to move things around, which replica from which node to pick, right? So the syntax and how you would define a preference is essentially what you tell solar is minimize on cores or do you want to maximize on free disks, right? So you, you basically give it the sort order where you say minimize or maximize and then you say the metric or the condition that you want to define it on. So I want to minimize on cores, I want to maximize free disk, minimize the load on my system obviously and essentially this is the syntax how you would define it. Okay, so there were criterias in this syntax where like you don't want to judge two solar nodes if their disk space differs by like a gigabyte or like five gigabytes, right? That might be some intermediary, like that's not enough reason to say node one is more important than node two. So we also have this option called precision where you basically tell solar that if it's within a precision level of, in this case, 10, so both nodes treat them equally, right? So if the difference between the values of free disks for two solar nodes is within this precision level, they are considered equivalent. Now, you can define multiple preferences, and what you can then tell is that the precision can have, you can have multiple preferences, and if you have the same disk space, then you move on to the next choice, right? You move on to the next preference that you've defined. So you can define a list of preferences that Solar will sort Solar, like, the nodes on. The API to do such a thing would be, you would say, define cluster preferences you would define the rules that you care about. So here I'm saying I want to minimize the solar cores on each node. And if the solar nodes happen to have the same number of cores, then pick uh, disk space as the metric to say this machine is more loaded than the second machine. Right? So you're defining multiple preferences in this case. If you just want to play around with this and understand once you have defined this, how this actually works and how is it picking one solar node over the other, there is a diagnostics endpoint where you're basically, it's giving you the sorted order of how it assumed that solar node one was more important than solar node two, right? So define it. Obviously, this is something that's new. You're going to start playing around with it. So you want to understand how the feature works. And the diagnostic API here can be very useful because you want to be telling Solo that sort it on these criteria and understand how it works. So there is a sort node, sorted nodes order. And then essentially, if you were violating, right? Remember how I said a preference is not a hard criteria. Right? So, but if you were still over the limit, you would see these violations that you would then go ahead and be able to act on. So, can you see how these tools can help you build or make life for DevOps easier, right? You are using these tools to now visualize how my cluster is performing. You don't need to no longer write APIs to figure these out you are just defining a language and saying, this is what I care about. You tell me, how is my cluster behaving? So these were the building blocks where policies and preferences can be used to figure out what to do on a solar cluster. Now, when we added these features, they were added so that all the collection APIs 
automatically use these policies and preferences. So if you go to create a collection, your create collection might fail if one of the policies that you had defined is not met by the criteria, right? So if it's an impossible task, Solar will stop and say, you know what, you cannot do this. So the policies will be violated and you'll be getting a hard error and creating the collection. When you add a replica, today you would need to build some smarts and be able to say, when I'm adding a replica, where should the replica reside? Today, Solar might just pick a node randomly, right? What you want to do is, you want to use the preferences and policies to now just say, add a replica, and Solar will go figure out which node to add it on. So the smart that you had to build in to figure out which node it had to go to is now abstracted away. Similarly, when you split shards or you create a shards, so if you're doing manual routing, you can keep adding shards over time. You can use these to figure out where should the shards land up. And when you back up and restore collections while doing a restore, you need to figure out where is the ideal place to restore a solar collection. So the restore API also taps into this. So this section of the talk was essentially defining policies, defining preferences, so that when you do these low level, I would, how I define low level commands is an add replica. Today in Solar, when you said add replica, I have to manually say which node should it go to. So it's abstracting all of these away and just helping you improve the experience. So with this, now that we had all of this in place, we could tell Solar, add a feature where whenever you create a collection, maintain my replication factor. So it might not be obvious to a lot of people uh, who started Solar like newly that when you add a collection or create a collection and you say, I want three copies of a shard, right? You say, give me three replicas. If a node was to go down, Solar would not maintain its replication factor. So you could be down to two replicas and you would not realize this, right? So Solar would not automatically add the third replica on nodes that were remaining so that the replication factor was continued through the life cycle of your cluster. You needed to build tools to make sure that if a node went down, figure out which replicas resided on that and to add them to the other nodes. So now you can enable something called auto add replicas, where essentially it will auto create these triggers, we'll talk about triggers in just a minute, where the replicas will get added to maintain the replication factor. Obviously, this uses the defined policies and preferences while adding the new replica. All you need to do is while creating a collection, pass auto add replicas equal to true while creating the collection and this feature will be enabled by default. So the experiment that I did while like making these slides was I had multiple nodes on different availability zones and what I was able to achieve was if I killed a node on one availability zone, Solar would go maintain the replication factor so it would add a replica and it would also respect the fact that I had defined rules to say maintain replication factor such that availability zones, the concept where not more than two replicas should be on each availability zones. So while adding the replica, it wouldn't go and create it on the other availability zone and now you'll have both my replicas on the other side of the other zone, right? So all of these, this API or this feature now works with the policies and preferences that you define. So this was the task that I kind of just tried out as an example so that we can, I can speak about it. Now that this was added, this feature kind of leverages internally something called solar autoscaling triggers and then event listeners. So essentially, till now you were defining rules, till now you were defining preferences, but solar was just giving you a diagnostics API, right? To, Till now what we learned was you just got to see 
how is my cluster behaving at the current point of time? But what if now you want to go and say, do something with it, right? So act on it. So which is why solar or like auto scaling triggers were added. So triggers once activated, perform actions such as evaluating the system against the configurations that you have defined. So in solar 7.1, there were two triggers that were introduced. The two triggers being if a node leaves the cluster or if a node joins the cluster. What do you do when these two events happen? So by default, what happens is in both cases, you move replicas around to balance the load. So if a node comes up, you want to say, oh, you know what? I have a new node. I want to balance my cluster. So there was a node that had more cores or more replicas, you want to move them around. So you would set a add node added trigger and it would go and do this thing. In Solar 7.3, more triggers were added. So you could add a search rate trigger. That means anytime you cross a certain threshold of queries per second, you could do like operations on it. You could set a scheduled trigger to do something if on a periodic basis, or you could use solar metrics. So solar has a metrics endpoint, which has over 250 metrics that it captures on each solar node. So you could leverage these metrics like a search rate or an index throughput or requests per second or high CPU volume or high GC, all of these metrics that solar collects you want to utilize that and say, now do something based on this metric. So it was very generic and could allow you to do that. Here is how you would define a node loss trigger. So I say, define a trigger called node lost, and you basically say, wait for 10 minutes. So don't just go, as soon as this event happens, start moving things around. Maybe I actually provisioned this node because I wanted to create a new collection or I wanted to do something that I wanted solar to not move things around because I, there was something else I had in mind. So you basically define a wait for. And triggers can be suspended, they can be paused, and they can be resumed. So it's not like once you define a trigger, like you need to delete them to get solar to stop uh, doing any actions on it. And like we covered in this slide, if you do a node lost or a node added trigger, it would just move replicas around since that seemed like the logical step to do when you define these triggers. Similarly, you say a node added trigger, the same syntax. You now, the, the one that kind of caught my attention was this search rate trigger, right? What you wanted to see is how do I tell solar during peak hours, I want to expand or I want to be able to add replicas so that my search volume, once it goes high through the day, it can expand and serve traffic in a more graceful manner. So the search rate trigger was added in Solar 7.3, where essentially it monitors the one minute average search rate. So it sees the average search rate for a minute and then you can define what to do in that case. You can define the search trigger on a per collection basis, a per shard basis, or a per on a node basis. So you can say, have 100 QPS on a solar node, and then I want to do an action on it. Or you can say, if a collection gets more than 30 requests a second, I think that's reaching a point where I need to add more replicas. So since it provided you options to do it on a per node or on a more granular per collection basis, the default actions that come with it were different. So when we define it for each node, right? So when you say it doesn't cross more than 100 QPS on each solar node, what you want solar to do is at that point move things around and make the load on that node less. So it moves, so the default action here is it moves the replica, which has the highest search rate, to another node. 
Now, if you define it on a per collection basis, right? So now when you say, if it doesn't go more than 30 qu queries per second for a shard or for a collection, the default action that Solo will take when you define this trigger is it will add a replica for the shard that goes above this threshold. So the default actions vary based on if you define it on a per collection basis or on a per shard basis or a per node basis. The API that you would define this would be, you would say, I want to create a search rate trigger, wait for 10 minutes to capture the metrics, and by default, in this case, since it's on a node level, it would go and move things around from that node to make the queries even distribute out evenly. So when I, now the, when I tried this exercise out, I looked at this and I said, oh, 80 queries a sec, like 80 queries. And the metric that it was capturing was the one minute metric. So I'm like, you know what, if I fire 80 queries in one minute, like I will achieve this and Solar will do something. But like the documentation clearly stated and I missed this part was essentially, it means you need to have a 80 queries per second. So it's not per minute, although the metric that it's capturing is the one minute average. So it wasn't really obvious to me, like, but seemed silly at that point. Uh, but when you say 80, what you mean is 80 queries per second, okay? Now that these triggers were added, the trigger has an action related to it, right? So all these actions that I'm talking to you about is because Solar by default says if you define a trigger, you can act on it because that's why you want to define this trigger. So the two actions that it supports is a compute plan. So it looks at the trigger that you've defined and it says, oh, you've created a search rate trigger and you define it on a per node basis. So the compute plan will say, move a replica, say, of a collection that had the most queries to some other node. So the compute plan generates this list of actions that you want Solar to perform, and the execute plan obviously carries out the operations. So if I was to take the whole thing and put it in an example, here is how I would say I would define a node added trigger. So when you define a node added trigger, you want to wait for say 60 seconds and then perform an action. So you've explicitly said compute a plan and then execute it, right? Now, what I thought is, I, I, I want to, at this point, I'm a, like thinking from a DevOps hat, right? I'm like, you know what? I don't trust this just yet. What I want to do is, I want Solar to definitely know that a node was added or the example that I played around with was the search rate trigger, right? As soon as search goes above a threshold, I don't want Solar to execute the plan. So I don't want Solar to actually go and start adding replicas, moving things around, but I want a notification. I know that something needs to be performed on the cluster. Something's not right. So if you remove the execute plan, like Solar will not actually do anything with the plan. It will just compute it and tell you oh, you need to move replica X from machine one to machine two, right? So you look at it, you're like, ah, oh, that makes sense. Let's go and execute them, right? So it's like a manual validation process that you might want to do if like you want to be more paranoid and like you probably want to when you're starting to try out a feature in Nune. So you could remove this. And one thing to keep in mind, if you don't define any actions, this actions will be performed by default. So unless explicitly defined and said, you know what, only do the compute action plan and not the execute, it will go ahead and do both the plans. So explicit, use in the explicit API and say exactly what you want out of the autoscaling trigger, right? Now, once this trigger was implemented, the last section was can I act on it in different ways, right? Apart from executing the plan, can I have a listener? Can I have Solar do certain events with it? So here, basically, I'm saying trigger listeners are nothing but are attached to a trigger to notify important lifecycle events. 
Now, example of a life cycle includes a trigger being activated when you abort overall success. So when you're moving replicas around, you will get notifications that, you know what? Node was added, started moving replicas, done or failed. So you would get notifications. Now, with these listeners, today Solar has two listeners with it. One is, it just writes out what operations it's doing to the underlying system collection. <laughs> um, so it writes this out to the system collection. So you define the underscore system collection, and every time this trigger is activated, you basically create docu add documents saying node added, starting operation, aborted, failed, success, all these events. So you can scroll through it and even get a visualization or something if you want to play around and make design a handcrafted solar query to see what was happening. The other event listener that Solar added was a HTTP listener. So an example of the HTTP listener is basically you're saying, I want on the trigger that I define, on stages aborted, succeeded, or failed, on these three stages of the trigger, send out this, hit this URL, right? So the experiment that I did for this talk was I created a search rate trigger. I said, you know what? I don't want Solar to go add replicas. I just want to define this trigger. And then I want to define this HTTP listener to send out alerts to a system, right? So define the trigger, define this alert, and you can get maybe an email notification. You can integrate this with your cloud provider so that if the search goes above a threshold, this will send out a notification to the cloud providers to start spinning up more instances. So you can use listeners in that sense. So that's all I had for the talk. We covered the basics of auto scaling and like hopefully these use cases will help you start using them in ways to help your management of your cluster. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Valerian. Yeah, I see hand raised. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I wondering if, for example, uh, you have specified some rule to move your replica to another node if you reach some QPS. Yeah. But uh, well, this node reached this uh, level of QPS. You moved the replica. But sure. Then this node will reach this so level of QPA, QPS. So you move it back. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so all the time, uh, Solar will just move throw things it around, yeah. To each other. So, which is why when you want to start off with, is you want to create an alert so that you see what's happening in the system, right? You might not want to trust this in the beginning. But what I assume what happens under the hood is, since it's moving to the other node, Solar also captures the metrics on the other node. So if this is not, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but it should not move the replica to this node if it's essentially going to violate it there, right? Like, so when you use the diagnostics API, it would come under the violation section. So it's gonna say, you know what? There's something wrong, but I'm not, I can't do anything about it because like, it's not gonna be a good action anyways. So those come under the diagnostics violations uh, yeah, but that. you have enough resources to move it there. Yes. So you do not violate the rules. So it's throw it away, <laughs> and every node will just throw it. Right. So so it wouldn't. It should not perform the operation and say, you know what, I'm above the threshold, but there's no good action to it. You see what I'm saying? So you can either specify to move it or just to send an alert. There yes. is no other... So, but it, what I'm saying way. is, uh, the move is not mandatory, right, in this case. So it'll say, it when it goes to move, it realizes that the move operation will lead to the other node going above the metric rate trigger, right? So it will say, this operation was aborted, right? That's why this, there were stages in that operation. 
So it will actually not perform the mood and it will come under the violations section when you use the diagnostics API. Yeah. You know, I didn't understand why, why it, it should uh, violate the rules. Are, are you, okay. Uh, <laughs> We'll take this offline, but I'll like, uh, maybe it's not very clear. I, I kind of have a similar question. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's a, um, a similar concept when you um, use a, a, a thing called hysteresis to make sure that you don't bounce something between two states to, uh, again and again. And it's, I, I think that's what you were asking here. Yeah. If you have some, another rule, another limit. Maximum. Yeah, move a replica off a, off a node, and oh, there's lots more disk space now. Oh, I can now move the replica back onto this node to lots of disk space now. And it, 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 you need some. You, it's not an it's an infinite uh, set of actions to satisfy the cluster. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, one sec. Are you adding to that? Yeah. The other question here, it's also going in that direction. So before it does something like moving it, uh, so for example, if you have something like system load uh, in your in your rules. Uh, does it also um, figure out if I do that action that maybe on the other machine the system load then goes too high? Yeah. So because it's not easy to calculate in that case, but are there some assumptions in it that, so just, does it just add the statistics and figure out? Yeah. Because it would not make any sense if it would make it worse. And Yeah, I'm not sure about system load, but I definitely imagine that like, we want to do something if I'm not 100% sure if we already do it, where if it goes above the search rate, that you can actually calculate if you yeah. move it to the other node, then you can whether do it, okay. it will go above the yeah. threshold or when you move it and the disk space issue, right? So okay. Solar might abort their operation in that case. I don't know whether it's already there or it's something that's in the plan. Uh, I can check that offline and get back to you. But like system load average will definitely be a, like, another challenge because you it's not easy to go and say you know what i have five replicas on a node but which node is taking the actual resources right so that's probably like a tough one there yeah like those are some things that you can calculate before you actually do the operation i think what would be useful to add to this would be some sort of limit like uh, go and do this operation a maximum of three times. Right, uh, that's what you like, so that it doesn't bounce infinitely, right? Yeah. Like, so maybe that's a Jira ticket that we've got to create. Yeah, Unless I'll have to already check. working on it. <laughs> like, absolutely. So you, and by putting a limit in there, maybe having a, that secondary trigger where it can notify you, or you, you know, you can alarm off of that and say, I, I've reached the maximum amount of actions that I can take. Uh, let me notify an operator so that we can now get a human involved, but I've done everything I've done. Yeah, I've so that's what, and like in his case, it gets even worse where if you move a replica to the other node and that node starts this trigger and picks some other replica, right? So then even this limits might not come into play because you're like, it's picking something else, right? It's not doing the operation on the same replica. Uh. It can uh, around. Round robins it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Throwing ball around. <laughs> well, like, uh, the good thing about it is uh, I'm not a hunt, like, you should definitely try it out. Remove the execute plan. Let it compute, gain some confidence, see what it's doing, send out alerts, start getting your feet wet with that, and feedback's always welcome, like stuff like this. I'm sure these are concerns that we want to address, and I'm like, a couple of them might already be there, I'll have to check, and... Another question, uh, yeah. if uh, the trigger uh, triggers some yeah. action, right. which is unlikely, but you noticed that it begin, it's beginning to operate this uh, action. Uh, do you have an a API to cancel it? So mm. you know it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, for you sure. You want to stop it. <laughs> yeah, you might like, like, you can't undo that operation, right? Because like, it's a set of collection API calls, so you're saying add replicas and like that's all in process. So to roll that back, like it would need to store state of the whole action, right, through the whole life cycle. 
So you would rather want it to either do nothing or to trust it and then like completely it's like like just compute it, right? Okay, I'm uh, sorry. Um, uh, uh, the Q and we'll A because we are run out of time. Uh, thank you very much, Varun. Give him a big hand again.